Good afternoon, everybody. This is Bassam Haddad, and I am the host of the new podcast, Flow. Uh, I am very uh, delighted today to be joined by uh, Hussam Bahgat on our episode two, an exceptional human rights defender and journalist who is joining us from Cairo. Today, we discuss the dire case of political prisoner Ala Abdel Fattah, who is on a heroic, though precarious, hunger strike. After he stopped drinking even water in the past few days, his freedom and his life are at risk. Stick around, this is important, and our guest is the best there is to address Ala's case and his uh, other fellow prisoners, political prisoners' uh, cases and uh, the struggle for freedom in Egypt in general. Welcome, Hussam. Kifak, how are you doing? Uh, well, I've asked people not to ask me that this week, uh, but uh, I'll allow it. I'm uh, I'm doing okay. Um, it's um, I mean, of course, uh, the, the main problem is uh, is just the level of worry and and concern. Uh, we have for Ala's uh, life and well-being, um, but um, apart from that, um, just um, regular, if a bit intense, uh, exhaustion. Well, thank you for joining us. I realized from the moment I tried to uh, get in touch that this would be a difficult conversation, but so many people would love to hear uh, from people like you what is going on with the with the case of uh, Ala. And uh, I would like to get to this very quickly, uh, but let me uh, share a few words about, about our guest, which is yourself. Hussam uh, Bahgat is a human rights defender and journalist with a background in political science and international human rights law. From 2002 to 2013, uh, Bahgat was a founder uh, or founding executive director of the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights and recently returned to lead the organization in 2020. His uh, investigative stories appeared in the independent news service Mada Masal. He served as board chair of the International Network for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. In 2010, Human Rights Watch awarded Bahgat the Alison uh, Deforge Award for Extraordinary Activism. And in 2014, he received the Catherine and George Alexander Law Prize from Santa Clara University. Bahgat is also a re the recipient of the Anna, uh, Polit hmm, Anna Politkos Kaya award for courageous journalism for his work um now he uh, let me just also say that in addition to the to what i what i already mentioned uh Bahaget is also himself in a bit of a precarious situation and has been uh, for some time and I will uh, try to address this uh, soon when we talk with Bahgat. But uh, because of his activism, activism, the Egyptian government has placed him under a travel ban and froze his assets for the last seven years. Uh, Bahgat, I uh, am again um, very happy you were able to join us, and I thank you for making this effort at this difficult time. This is clearly um, a, a, a very... Uh, uh, a very difficult moment for all of us. Uh, and I know it's difficult to talk, but uh, I do have some questions. And uh, I would like to start by asking you to give us an update on Ala's condition. We heard several uh, stories about the consequences of him not drinking water for the past few days. And we'd love to know uh, from you uh, where he's at. Uh, do we know where he's at and how is he being treated or treated at all? Um, that's a major part of the concern is that the answer is we don't know. Um, he stopped drinking water um, last Sunday, so it's been seven days, um, and he hasn't been seen or heard from ever since. And uh, his mother's attempts um, for several days uh, between Monday and Thursday 
to um, get a letter from him or even a um, any proof of life um, have been unsuccessful um, his uh, lawyer uh, mr Khaled ali uh, finally received um, permission to visit him last uh, thursday um, of course all the previous um, uh, visitation permits were either declined or illegally ignored after having been issued. Um, this time we thought that maybe we will finally get the, the proof of life and a uh, check on Alain's health and um, consciousness uh, on Thursday. But uh, again, the public uh, prosecutor's office issued the permit. The prison authorities refused to implement the permit saying it was only valid for one day. Uh, which had already expired. Um, we, uh, his lawyer filed for another um, visit today and we're hoping to um, hear back and maybe receive uh, the permit tomorrow, in which case maybe tomorrow for the first time uh, since Sunday of last week, um, he will be seen and we will ascertain his well-being. <clears throat> He's kept in the Wadi al Natrun uh, prison, uh, which has recently been rebranded uh, <clears throat> as the Wadi Natrun Rehabilitation Center, um, referred to by President Sisi as an American style prison. Um, he believed uh, that was a good thing. And um, it's a massive uh, prison complex, and uh, <clears throat> we understand that Ala is kept in a hospital or a medical facility. Um, inside that prison. On Wednesday morning, <clears throat> for the first time, um, a prison official informed his mother that, um, which he insisted to know to have a proof of life. Um, she was told that he was fine. A medical interventions were made for his own good um, based on uh, legal authorization. So we all took that to mean either force feeding or IV. Uh, we don't know if it's continuing or if it was a one-time thing. Um, we simply don't know uh, anything about his current um, condition. And of course, in the morning, the prison authority admitted to force feeding him. In the evening, the public prosecutor issued a, um, a uh, public um, uh, press release um, containing many falsehoods, uh, including that um, Ale was examined in early November and all his vital signs were great and um, the doctors concluded he was not even on a hunger strike. Uh, so we got these two narratives from the state um, in the same day, on the same day in Wednesday, in the morning he's being force fed, in the evening he's not even on strike. The same happened on Thursday, in the morning we get a permission to visit him in the afternoon, the prison authorities refused to allow the visit. Thanks, Hassam. In the conditions he's under, uh, what, I mean, given that the idea here is that if you are on hunger strike for more than 220 days and then you cut off water and liquids, you actually uh, deteriorate very quickly. What, 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 what is the scenario here? I mean, this is, this is uh, nerve wracking and it is something that uh, so many of us probably wake up thinking about. Uh, and, I, and I do understand and I do know that he's not the only one who is uh, in prison. We will talk about that as well. And this has happened um, uh, all over, frankly, uh, the world, including in our region. Uh, but we're focusing on his symbolic and really important case. And, and if you can just tell us what what might be the scenarios here. Is, is there any sort of uh, potential uh, emergency intervention that can take place from within or from without, given the, uh, the, the potential fate of this, uh, uh, of this situation? <clears throat> um. I mean, obviously, I haven't seen Ale um, except briefly in, in court when he was on trial last year. Um, but I haven't seen him since he was convicted. His family last visited him last month in October. And it had already been 
um, a long time of his partial hunger strike or um, Palestinian inspired hunger strike as he called it um, and he was uh, on a hundred calories per day uh, um, his family said he was just skin on bones and um, appeared very weak but lucid and in high spirits uh, because he believed uh, that for the first time in nine years and especially in this stint of imprisonment in three years he as he said was in control of his own fate in control of his own body uh, because of his strike on November 1st was the last time he wrote a letter to his um, mother and uh, family um, and uh, that's when he informed uh, them and us um, and the world that he was reducing his calorie intake to zero starting November 1 and um, and then stop um, stopping um, consuming water on the first day of uh, COP27, the UN Climate Summit, on Sunday the 6th um, <clears throat> of November. I, um, frankly, I, I don't want to think about the scenarios. Um, I don't want to go there, but we, I mean, suffice it to say, we are gravely concerned um, uh, because he was already very weak to start with. Um, so this must have been um, a, a difficult transition he made. We're also worried about um, the conditions and um, method that was followed to apply this so-called medical intervention. Um, was it violent? Was it involuntary? Um, is, um, is he handcuffed? Is he under independent medical supervision? Uh, there are just all sorts of questions and we're all very concerned and one can only imagine how his family feels. <clears throat> so yes, um, since Sunday we've been doing nothing except um, um, uh, trying to um, find a resolution uh, to this uh, ordeal. It's a nine-year uh, ordeal, uh, but it's become particularly critical uh, <clears throat> this week. And um, I, I can't really say uh, uh, whether or not um, we are close to a resolution. Uh, right now, um, our hope is um, on the very, very immediate term to um, have proof of life, access to him by his lawyer and or mother, um, hopefully as early as tomorrow. Uh, in order to ascertain his health and condition and consciousness. Um, and that, uh, of course, is um, going parallel to a third attempt by his family uh, starting last night in Cairo time uh, to um, uh, submit another petition to the president, Sisi, uh, demanding his release on uh, humanitarian ground based on the president's constitutional power to amnesty convicted prisoners. So these are our, the two tracks that um, are being um, sort of explored for a resolution right now. You're muted. Okay, good. I hope we hear better news. I'm just all uh, taken uh, by uh, by this coming week, and uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm out of words, which is which is very unlikely. Shukran, uh, Hussam. Uh, let me ask you a little bit for those who might not be uh, aware of the entire background. Let me ask you a little bit about the background. Uh, of Ala's uh, arrest and imprisonment, and why was he imprisoned? And it seems singled out, given that there are many others that were imprisoned with him and since. If you can give us a quick background, I'd appreciate it. 
Uh, sure. Alec's um, story with the prison is a very long one, but I'll try to give you uh, the short, uh, um, shortest possible version of it. Um, obviously, he was arrested under Mubarak. He was arrested under the military council that took over after Mubarak. He was uh, charged and prosecuted under um, Mohamed Morsi, and, uh, and then he was arrested very early um, after the ouster of, of Morsi in the 8th of 2013 um, on uh, a charge of participating in an illegal protest, uh, which was a demonstration um, outside the building where the new constitution was being drafted um, and uh, the demonstration demanding um, an uh, end or a prohibition on the military trials of civilians, a demonstration that Ale did not call for nor participate in. He was not there, but he was still arrested for having taken part in this um, protest and um, tried and sentenced to five years, followed by five years under quote-unquote police supervision. He served um, his five-year term between 2014 and 2019. <clears throat> and, um, and then when he was released, he was forced to uh, spend every night in the police station uh, from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., um, which is the most extreme interpretation of um, police probation. Uh, you know, the law allows for a multitude of options, um, including the house arrests or a banning from leaving the neighborhood or a city or a reporting to the police station every week or even reporting every day. But to have to sleep in the police station every night from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. was extremely disrupting and also did not enable him to rebuild his life after five years um, in prison. Um, and particularly affected his ability to find employment uh, or to have a uh, normal um, relationship with, with his son, um, uh, whom he hadn't seen for, for five years. Um, a few months under these uh, harsh conditions, um, there was a call for protest uh, by some defecting um, contractor abroad named Muhammad Ali. Uh, who started uh, uh, taping and airing videos um, revealing details about corruption um, in the building of presidential palaces and other aspects of corruption in um, the construction sector by the state um, to which he was privy. Uh, very few people, there was a demand by him for people to take to the streets, very few people uh, um, heeded that call and took to the streets. Um, the government uh, did not only, it, it was the first anti-CC demonstration um, uh, really since his election in 2014. Um, and uh, uh, it was decentralized, um, so few people but in a number of different neighborhoods and cities. The government responded by the worst uh, uh, wave of arrests that we've seen under CC uh, since 2013. A very wide crackdown, thousands of people got arrested, uh, close to 6,000. Uh, some of them are actually still in detention now. Um, and the government did not stop there. I mean, of course, they arrested those suspected of having participated, and then they arrested randomly. Uh, especially young men um, in, in places where demonstrations happened even if they had nothing to do with them. And then they arrested people who posted uh, messages about the demonstrations or videos and then arrested people who expressed support or happiness uh, for seeing these protests. And then they simply decided to arrest political figures and um, high profile names and human rights lawyers and journalists uh, even though these September 2019 protests were not endorsed by any political party or any political grouping inside Egypt, um, but the government just felt so paranoid um, and so humiliated um, to, see, to be caught off guard. Uh, and Ale, unfortunately, was one of those uh, swept away uh, in the September 2019 um, campaign. 
Uh, one day after his arrest, uh, he was presented to the national security, uh, the state security prosecutor. Um, his lawyer, Muhammad al Bakr, went to represent him. His lawyer was detained inside the uh, prosecutor's office uh, and was added as a co defendant of Ali. Uh, they have both been um, in, in prison since then, so uh, for over three years now. Then they were. Um, charged with uh, spreading false information, uh, just like thousands uh, of other uh, Egyptians, uh, based on one Facebook uh, post by Muhammad al-Baqir and one Facebook share of a post uh, by Ali about prison abuse. They were presented to an emergency state security court, uh, which not only does not allow the right of appeal, it's sort of a one-shot a trial, but also um, where the judges are handpicked to try uh, political cases. Um, in this particular case, which I observed, um, the judge simply did not allow the defense counsel uh, the right to access the case files. So um, the lawyers were supposed to present their defense based just on the charge sheet. Um, no access to evidence um, or witness testimonies or uh, police investigations, uh, or even the interrogation transcripts of uh, with Ali uh, Bakr and Muhammad Oxygen, who, is, who was added as the third defendant in the case, um, a, uh, a video journalist um, and, and blogger. Um, so, I mean, the lawyers insisted that they can't present their defense, and the judge simply ignored their plea and sentenced Ali to five years and Bakr and Oxygen to four years. Um, without hearing a single lawyer in the case. Uh, there was no, there were no defense pleas, there was no access to the documents, um, and there is no right of appeal. Um, and uh, all three of them have been um, in, in jail serving this sentence ever since. Shukran. Thank you, Hassam. Um, this is, uh, of course, all very uh, upsetting uh, and beyond upsetting. Uh, and I feel that uh, we can talk about any of these segments uh, for for the rest of the of the hour. But uh, I hope uh, I hope you can uh, forgive me for continuing to ask uh, questions of the sort, uh, given the uh, <laughs> the importance of this issue so i'm i'm going to talk a little bit or ask you to talk a little bit about the wider context in egypt the context uh of uh various violations of human rights the restriction of public space and the uh, uh the sort of uh dominance of a particular sort of media that kind of uh, reinforces uh government discourse and kind of uh uh cast a shadow on, on other alternatives inside Egypt. If you can tell us about where this uh, uh, atmosphere is right now and what direction it might be going in, given some of the things that I'd like to ask you about, including the announcement of the national dialogue uh, that came out in which the Muslim Brotherhood were not allowed to participate, but um, which, which seems to be uh, not a sign of strength, actually, uh, and... Uh, Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about about the, the atmosphere today and, and, and whether we should or can be looking for uh, some signs of hope. Um, okay, um, multiple questions there. Um, uh, for the past eight years, Egypt uh, has been um, in a full-scale human rights crisis, uh, which is not exactly... Um, uh, a description we give Egypt uh, before CC. Uh, I've been doing uh, this on and off for 20 years. So I worked under Mubarak for um, uh, over 10 years on, on the same issues. And of course, Egypt was never really a, um, um, you know, a liberal democracy. Um, it's always been a country with a problematic uh, human rights record with areas of concern, uh, some of them systematic and um, uh, policy-based. Um, and uh, 
uh, it was, um, you know, often correctly described as an authoritarian um, regime uh, with um, uh, almost unlimited powers given to uh, state security investigations, which was the political arm uh, of uh, the interior ministry, um, and um, where torture was rampant. Um, and and but but it, but there was still a um, multiple sites of resistance uh, at the time that we all engaged in. Um, civic space was limited, uh, but still vibrant and diverse. Um, what happened? Uh, what ha what's happening in Egypt right now is not that there are violations with impunity. Um, it's that. Egypt has become not just a country of concern, but one of the worst abusers of human rights in the whole world. That is a new status that only emerged in the last few years. Um, and it's not an emotional statement. It's, I mean, objectively, um, if you look at, you know, any independent ranking of countries around the world on any human rights measure, you will find Egypt on all of them among sort of the worst three or five um, violators. Um, I mean, last year we were, um, you know, the first country in the world in terms of the number of death sentences, the third in the world in terms of um, carried out executions of inmates. Uh, we were the third uh, worst jailer of journalists in the world. Um, and uh, if you look at the sheer uh, size of the population of political prisoners, uh, the number of uh, blocked websites, the number of available independent media sources, um, uh, I mean, on any of these measures, really, Egypt has become um, you know, up there with Belarus and Uzbekistan uh, in terms of its uh, its human rights uh, record. And people don't usually, uh, people who don't follow Egypt well, they don't usually get um, this massive change that uh, took place uh, on the CC, that uh, all um, uh, aspects of the, the civic space was simply eviscerated. It just doesn't exist uh, anymore. Uh, all human rights defenders are facing criminal prosecutions, um, asset freezes, uh, travel bans, um, uh, you know, with a very, very, um, uh, you know, uh, margin uh, available for them to work from their offices. Um, lawyers are being arrested, uh, like uh, the example I just gave of Mohammed al uh while representing their clients inside courtrooms, uh, they're being detained. Um, like I said, the third highest number of journalists in prison, uh, the number of independent uh, Egyptian news media outlets uh, that uh, are available to the Egyptian people uh, is zero uh, currently, uh, because every single independent news website is blocked in Egypt, uh, forcing these websites to either, um, you know, publish on social media or call on readers to use VPN. So the government went ahead and blocked hundreds of uh, VPN um, applications and websites so that people cannot um, uh, sort of overcome the block. Uh, this, I mean, I'm, this is the first time in Egypt, um, you know, since the late 70s that the country does not have a single opposition newspaper, not one. Um, they've, um, and, and the private or independent uh, media outlets were um, over two years directly purchased by the General Intelligence Service um, um, through private companies that they created, not even shell companies because they're not hiding the fact uh, that this is the state um, taking corrective measures to regulate the media sphere. So they simply went around and bought uh, all newspapers, all satellite channels, and all independent websites uh, that they could buy, with the exception of maybe three or four uh, percent of, uh, of the others. Um, I mean, 
I could go on for, forever, but for me as a human rights uh, defender, the main challenge is that there are is that there is no political process in the country uh, that hasn't been for years. And so when I did this job under Mubarak, um, you know, as a human rights organization, what we did was use you know the toolbox available to us. So we would, um, you know disseminate our findings through independent media, bring court cases against the government um, in litigation, uh, human rights litigation efforts, lobby uh, reform-minded or opposition members of parliament, uh, sometimes even uh, do advocacy with government officials, representing them with policy um, recommendations, um, doing some um, community level work in terms of capacity buildings and trainings and um, sometimes attempts at, at even organizing. Um, right now, really, I mean, when I came back to this job uh, two years ago for the first time under CC, uh, <clears throat> I honestly uh, don't know how to do human rights work when you don't have any of these channels, any of these avenues, because, um, like I said, all the media have been um, nationalized uh, now, not just by the state, but by security agencies. Um, there is, um, uh, I mean, the judiciary has been completely co-opted. Um, it's very rare now uh, that we find a judge who is willing to even consider finding against the state, even in the most straightforward cases that we used to bring and win all the time in the past. Uh, parliament is uh, completely sacked with uh, stacked with um, uh, pro-military, pro-regime um, members of, of parliament uh, without a single sort of opposition uh, block um, to speak of. And the opposition, uh, um, you know, uh, parties uh, that actually managed to get seats in parliament, they ran on the national list, which is the government's list, in order to get these seats. So there was a sort of an electoral coalition. Um, zero access to the government, even the very few reform-minded um, state officials um, that have not been sacked, um, they are too scared uh, to meet with us. Um, they don't um, uh, receive us, um, and they send us sometimes secrets in, in uh, messages in secret. Uh, and of course, uh, absolutely zero chance of doing work on the ground with communities. Um, not just because it became so dangerous for our staff and members, um, but extremely dangerous to the communities themselves. Uh, and we can see the results of this in that I mean, there, were, there are former, former sites of resistance that for years fought against forced eviction uh, or um, you know, uh, other housing and land rights uh, abuses um, that are now being completely raised uh, with absolutely no, um, um, you know, uh, resistance, because the people are, um, you know, completely disempowered. The organizations are not allowed to be there, and the media is, um, um, you know, um, putting a lid on it and not covering it uh, at all. And so the regime is getting away with uh, with doing exactly what it had tried to do in places like the Ware Island. Uh, or uh, the Maspiro Triangle or other, other places where people were actually organized in popular committees and engaged in um, negotiations with the state or direct action uh, or, or, or uh, uh, litigation in court. None of this um, appears to be happening now. Which brings me to your last uh, bit about the national dialogue. I mean, this is... Um, um, it, so against this context that I described, of course, the very uh, fact that there is going to be a process of a few sessions, a few meetings, where the government um, and its security uh, arm is listening to anyone uh, is, uh, is uh, a net positive, in, in my view, because there are no other political processes in the country. So. Um, this could be a very um, marginal uh, return of politics, a very uh, uh, small and temporary window 
put our findings, our recommendations, some of our proposals for legal reform uh, or uh, policy changes. Um, but more importantly, uh, of course, it's better to be in a state of dialogue than in a state of crackdown. And so some of the people that I have engaged over the last few months in the preparatory phase of this national dialogue um, through a board of trustees and some thematic rapporteurs, some of them uh, from the opposition were in prison as recently as last year. Uh, and now this year they're sitting at the table setting the agenda of the dialogue and um, agreeing who would be invited and what format uh, the dialogue would say we would take. Having said all of this, um, there are no big expectations in terms of the outcome of this dialogue. We think there will be some sessions, um, things will be said, the ideas will be presented. Some of them will be taken up in sort of a final report or a series of reports that would con include um, some recommendations and be presented to, to the president. Um, it's important to get as many um, substantive policy and legal uh, proposals uh, on the record in this report uh, again just for the as a historical record of really um, you know what was wrong and what needed to be fixed and didn't uh, i mean wasn't um, but uh, but in terms of the outcome no one really has any illusions about this national dialogue leading to you know a process of democratizing or course correction. There might be some incremental, uh, tangible um, fixes uh, to some um, uh, systemic problems, or at least that's our hope. Uh, um, and the government, uh, or at least the government's representatives in the preparatory phase of the dialogue have expressed um, uh, some degree of openness to discussing, um, you know, resolution to some of the major systemic problems. Uh, the issue of pre-trial detention that is open-ended and sort of destroying the lives of thousands um, of, of political prisoners, um, some discussion about media freedoms and um, the um, procedures for licensing websites as well as blocking uh, websites. So, as you see, technical um, uh, issues uh, that, that uh, the government might be willing to entertain if they don't find them uh, threatening enough. Uh, it comes, uh, this dialogue comes in a context, of course, of uh, the regime trying over the past few months to send some positive signals, reflecting a sensitivity to its um, a terrible image uh, abroad and a complete loss of the narrative. Um, and, um, you know, it was in the anticipation of the COP27 uh, taking place, but also um, COVID coinciding with the very worsening of the economic situation and a rise in uh, public anger um, at the uh, you know, uh, rise in the cost of living and uh, for the first time people blaming uh, the president for economic mismanagement and for the decisions and priorities he instituted uh, over the past uh, eight years. Um, so the government, the president called for this national dialogue uh, reactivated a presidential pardon committee that has over the last six months um, uh, released or proposed the release uh, of over 800 political <coughs> <coughs> sorry it's been a very stressful week so i've been smoking uh, non-stop <coughs> um, so excuse my cough um, so the problem with these positive signals although they are welcome and they reflect some degree of awareness uh, that things uh, have uh, become so extreme um, and therefore so untenable. Um, the problem with them is that they did not, they are just that signals. Uh, they did not translate into tangible systemic or policy changes. Uh, and of course, the most famous example to this is, uh, or evidence to this is that over six months through the amnesty process, 800 people were released um, but state security, national security, and the you know um, state security prosecutors have detained um, and uh, put in remand over a thousand five hundred uh, political prisoners, almost twice as much as those that were released. Um, and because the government hasn't made a policy, uh, sort of statewide decision to stop the prosecution 
um, and arrest and, and remand of um, uh, people on account of expressing their views or engaging in peaceful political activism. The websites remain closed. The cases against us remain open. I'm still banned from travel. And, um, you know, um, they keep promising that the national dialogue is going to be a breakthrough on some of these issues. Um, we will engage in good faith, but like I said, with eyes wide open and without um, without very um, uh, high expectations. That is, if we are invited, of course, because the invitations haven't yet uh, gone out, uh, and they haven't yet selected the names of who would uh, attend as experts in any of these committees, including the Human Rights Subcommittee. Shukran, Hussam. Um, I want to ask you about the Egyptian uh, initiative for personal rights, which uh, is a non-profit that you created. But first, let me ask you quickly about your own condition, because we do know that you have also been uh, restricted in various ways. And if you can tell us a little bit about that and, and, and how common this is and whether there is a, an end game or a point at which this will be lifted. Um, now, as you mentioned, um, I immediately after the 2011 revolution, uh, as, as part of sort of the reprisal against those seen to be responsible uh, for paving the way for it, uh, there were different measures taken to target and punish different sectors. With the human rights community, it was a big criminal investigation called Case 173. Um, known as the foreign funding case that looked at all the human rights organizations' activities um, in the last year under Mubarak. Uh, so the investigation, so-called investigation, has been ongoing since 2011, so for 11 years now. And um, I am uh, one of the defendants in this um, uh, investigation. I was finally uh, indicted later, and in 2016, uh, as part of this so-called investigation uh, as a precautionary measure, they said um, uh, they issued a travel ban that uh, prohibited me from leaving Egypt for the last seven years. And then um, they requested and obtained a freeze on my personal assets, which meant suspending my only bank account um, for the last uh, seven years again, since 2016. Um, there are many promises that this is going to be resolved, that the case is going to be closed, but it's obviously uh, very beneficial for the government um, to, to um, you know, keep us under these, um, not just the fear of indictment and, and imprisonment, but also um, this constant uh, pressure uh, of an open criminal investigation with these punitive measures. Um, I was detained in 2015 uh, on a military case, a different one, uh, for, uh, for an investigative piece uh, that I wrote for, for Madame Asr. So I still have an open um, military um, case uh, for spreading false information. Um, and then and uh, last year I was indicted this time and actually stood the trial uh, for insulting the High Election Commission. Uh, in a tweet I uh, wrote about uh, the irregularities of the 2020 parliamentary election, but I was thankfully sentenced to a fine. Um, three other colleagues uh, of mine at EIPR were uh, detained in late uh, 2020 on charges of illegal uh, membership of an illegal organization, <coughs> which is why I came back to this job. Uh, um, they were later released, but the charges are still standing, and they are all banned from travel and also have their assets frozen. It will be exactly two years um, next week uh, since that had happened. And finally, one of our researchers is currently on trial before an emergence. Um, about the rights of Christians in Egypt, our researcher, Patrick Zaki. Um, so that's just three cases for me, three cases for EIPR, including mine, and that's just one organization. Um, and, uh, you know, 
with this magnificent uh, record, uh, we are still considered very lucky because none of us are currently in prison because we are still operating as much as we can as an organization. Um, and that is, of course, um, a luxury compared to the fate of the thousands of people that have that are currently locked away or have been disappeared or had to move to exile. Thanks again, Hossam. Um, let me uh, ask you uh, more directly about uh, the actual uh, organization you created, uh, I presume some two decades ago, uh, the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights. And if you could tell us a little bit about why you established it, what does it do, and how is it handling or being handled in this climate? I think we lost your audio for some reason. Yeah, sorry. Okay. I just needed to cough. Um, I, uh, I founded Sahar. EIPR um, when I was, thank you, when I was an undergraduate uh, student of political science at Cairo University. It was 2002. Um, after a few years of uh, learning and practicing journalism, uh, political um, uh, journalism, um, and the idea back then was to have a human rights organization that was um, sort of young and dynamic and professional because we were all in our early 20s, but at the same time also took on all the issues uh, that were seen as not part of the mainstream that have been overlooked or deliberately disregarded by the mainstream uh, human rights organizations of the time. So we we're interested in the right to privacy, including issues of sexuality and reproductive rights uh, of women. Um, we were interested in uh, freedom of religion and belief, including for non-recognized faiths in Egypt. We were interested in um, uh, health issues, HIV-related um, um, uh, human rights violations and discrimination. And then over the years, we started, I mean, we kept expanding our purview, of course, uh, Part of it, because we gradually got a hang of it, uh, but part of it also because we increasingly became aware of uh, the intersectionality. I mean, each issue would just take us on to the next issue, and um, and and um, the the human rights situation in the country overall started also shifting in 2005 with a relative and short. Uh, short-lived uh, degree of openness in 2005 under Mubarak um, that, as you remember, was called the Arab Spring uh, back then in Lebanon, Egypt, and, and Iraq. Um, and so we took on other issues of political freedom of uh, human rights defenders, the state of emergency, and um, um, so uh, the civic, open civic issues. Um, and then after the revolution, when we were full uh, freedom of movement, uh, that we were able to actually travel around Egypt for the first time without fear of arrest, including to places like Sinai, um, we expanded even further. Uh, so we took on, you know, a generalist approach of civil liberties, criminal justice reform, economic and social justice, not just health, but you know, labor, education, economic inequality, etc., um, and um, um, you know, political rights and civic space issues. And then the crackdowns uh, started um, and uh, intensified. So, of course, we sort of retreated again. Um, you know, we had opened offices around the country in in Luxor, Alexandria, we had a presence in the Delta and Ismailia. Um, we had to close all this down because it just became too impossible to secure. Um, 
the colleagues that work uh, remotely. Um, and right now, we are uh, continuing with um, you know, um, policy research and fact-finding um, advocacy campaigns to the extent possible, like the work that we're doing this week in, in Sharm el-Sheikh, and um, providing legal aid and legal assistance to victims trying to find the rare occasion uh, of um, filing a strategic litigation uh, case before the courts. Incredibly proud of the work uh, we have done, uh, but fully aware of the limitations also of uh, that work, especially when I remember um, how things were between 2011 and 2013, when we really could dream big and act big uh, despite the very difficult um, political situation back then. Um, right now, of course, things are about to get even more precarious for us because the government is forcing all existing um, entities, so civil society entities, to register under a new NG, NGO law. Um, and you have no choice to opt out of that law. And um, it imposes severe restrictions um, and surveillance um, and approval of the activities and financing of NGOs by um, the government ministry, which in effect, of course, is just a, a facade for the security agencies. And the deadline for registration is April of next year. So in the next six months, we will have to go through the process of seeking um, registration under this new law and then um, engage in um, the very difficult path of existing under these new um, government and security regulations. Shukran, uh, Hussam. <clears throat> might, you, um, might you tell us a little bit uh, about COP27 and the potential promise or disappointment it might carry for everyone as uh, you know uh, hundreds of uh, important figures are are involved and could it be an opportunity to expose or pressure the government to address arbitrary detention for instance of political prisoners and um, is is this is this uh, a potential happening in terms of results not just but not just the uh, the addressing of issues and what do you suspect might happen after uh cop 27 considering that there the there, there, there is a shining light now on on egypt uh, so what what might uh, the future hold or the near future hold after cop 27 Um, now, of course, in the, uh, initially our approach to COP27 was, you know, sort of a two-track strategy. Um, my organization, like I just said, works on economic and social justice issues and started 10 years ago to work uh, specifically on environmental justice, um, fact-finding, um, research, and uh, litigation. And so the first track was that, you know, we wanted to engage on the substantive agenda of uh, the summit. Um, we wanted to um, um, work with global uh, civil society and climate justice activists uh, to put pressure uh, on world leaders and CEOs uh, to deliver on past commitments and uh, deliver for the, the planet. And parallel to that, of course, we wanted, we planned to use this global spotlight that you refer to in order to highlight the magnitude of the human rights crisis in the country, but also in order to build solidarity uh, with activists from around the world, um, around our issues, and more importantly, to encourage the government through indirect advocacy to take some steps to improve the human rights situation before the COP takes place. So, <coughs> excuse me. Now, of course, the strike of Ale took uh, precedence 
uh, uh, this week and became uh, sort of a symbol of what is wrong and what needs to be done um, in, in the country. Um, but overall, uh, uh, you know, the first of two weeks um, just ended. And, uh, and I think we got more Egypt than we did for years. Hussam, we might have lost you. Did we? Can you hear me? Okay, it looks like we, we lost Hussam, and I suspect he will try to call back. Um, in the meantime, uh, I can share a little bit about uh, another matter, uh, or a related matter, but through the eyes of the uh, digital uh, artist and scholar, uh, Leila Shirin. I would like to share her um, mosaic of uh, a free ala uh, image which uh, happens to be online and available for everyone to see. I will share it now and uh, talk a little bit about how uh, it works. Um, it is a uh, mosaic that, let me put it up first so essentially um it is a, mos a mosaic that uh, as we can see features uh, several thousands of tweets that uh came out uh in support of uh, ala and these uh, tweets are the uh, uh element that make up this canvas you can just scroll through it and uh, look at all of these tweets at the same time uh, that you could click on them and go to these tweets and learn more about uh, his plight. It's a very interesting uh, uh, work of art and uh, political art. And I hope you can uh, check it out at archief.org. That's r-s-h-i-e-f.org slash free ala and i'll also add it to the uh, final announcement that will uh, appear with the video soon here we go i think we have i think hussam is back with us uh hussam and tamana okay there we go sorry hussam you got cut off about about 30 seconds before we lost the connection with you and uh, you were addressing the tail end of the uh, COP27 question. Yeah, sorry. I'm sure you've seen the news story about the logistical problems of COP, including the unreliable uh, internet connection, um, <laughs> both uh, in hotels as well as on the conference uh, premises. Um, so, I mean, I was just concluding to say that um, it's been a rare and good opportunity for us so far. Uh, we, of course, knew that we would be taking a risk um, speaking up just before and throughout the two weeks of COP. Uh, the risk uh, sort of increased, of course, uh, with um, the hunger strike and water strike of Ale and then the participation of his sister Sana um, at the COP. Uh, the government is, uh, has reacted uh, in a very angry uh, way, um, uh, launching a um, uh, vicious, severe campaign, vicious even by standards of this regime, um, targeting especially Sana and myself, accusing us of treason for having come to a climate conference to turn it into a human rights conference and ruin the summit for Egypt after all the hard work they put into organizing it and turning a glorious occasion for Egypt into an embarrassment uh, for the country, et cetera. Um, but so in light of this, um, of course, we do expect that there would be consequences. 
after the COP is over. Um, but like I said previously, it's a, it's a risk that we decided was worth taking. And if it leads to saving Ale's life and securing his freedom, um, then we would be very pleased that it would be two weeks uh, well spent. Taban, Taban, um, for sure. Thank you, um, Hussam. Uh, I have kept you a bit longer than promised. We're a few minutes, a couple minutes after um, one o'clock. Uh, Eastern time, and I'm assuming it's uh, around eight in Cairo. I'll, I'll, uh, before I ask you if you have, you know, some final comments, I want to leave you with the uh, not an easy question, which is about uh, the future, uh, but also about the, your analysis of what's going on right now and what might, uh, what that might portend uh, for the near future. And that has to do with the potential effects of the looming economic uh, and financial crisis in Egypt, which it's almost global, right? We were also discussing the same thing here in the United States. In particular, how do you think this might affect uh, the future of uh, the opposition and its mobilization? And would it potentially reveal uh, cracks uh, or divisions? Uh, or lead to cracks or divisions within the regime. Uh, is this something that is being um, uh, looked at as as, a, as an important important moment, considering the the uh, real potential of a uh, serious economic crisis ahead? Yeah, I mean, I think the economic crisis is here already, uh, but uh, everyone is expecting it to um, get much worse next year in 23. Um, and um, I think this is going to be the most important factor at play in the next two years, especially that you know we have presidential elections for CC's third term in early 24. So, um, and this, like I said, is the first time uh, under CC that people are actually pointing fingers at him and accusing him of failing because of course he there was so much glorification of him when he first came to power he was turned into this godlike um, figure who was sent to us by destiny to save us not just from the Muslim Brotherhood but to return Egypt to greatness etc and he spent years promising people the moon promising S sounds um, Returning people to greatness sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and n now, of course, his uh, discourse has changed recently. Uh, he only talks about perseverance in the face of problems and asks for people for on first the pandemic and then on the Ukraine war. Uh, but everyone understands that these, although they put pressure on the economy, they were just triggers of the expected results of economic decisions made by CC throughout his eight years in office. People have warned him about excessive borrowing and a huge rise in uh, foreign debts. Uh, priorities um, for spending this borrowed money, uh, um, long-term loans for very short-term uh, projects. Some are mega projects, not necessary, uh, and without an increase in funding of health or education or social protection. Um, and of course, now these loans are maturing this year, next year, and the following one, um, and all um, media and research institutes agree that um, there is a significant funding uh, financing gap uh, in terms of um, service. The last uh, state budget uh, presented by the government and adopted by the government parliament um, has over 50%, more than 50% of the state budget 
um, is allocated to servicing the debt, paying for debts and loans and, and their interests. Um, and that is, uh, of course, uh, not likely to change with the recently agreed IMF loan, uh, because it's going to be the third IMF loan since 2016. Um, it will bring some more austerity measures and spending cuts. Um, the pound had to be devalued um, again um, in order to satisfy uh, the conditions for concluding the new loan. Um, inflation is uh, already rising and is expected to rise even more next year. Um, and people are just, um, you know, in despair. Um, and the only thing the government is telling them and CC is telling them is to be patient. So yes, um, it's going to be a difficult uh, two years. Um, I don't have any final words to say except to apologize for um, um, being extremely exhausted after a very long day, uh, after a series of seven very long days at COP. Unfortunately, COP works on Saturdays as well. Um, and also for um, my voice being affected by uh, a week of uh, chain smoking. Uh, but um, uh, hopefully I'll do better on the next interview. This has been a remarkable, uh, yeah, Hussam. Who, uh, I'm, I'm really delighted that uh, we were able to uh, speak with you and uh, learn uh, so much about what is happening with uh, Ala and what's happening in Egypt and what is going on uh, right now, uh, actually, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, COP27, uh, meeting and the potential of it. Thank you for also telling us about your own situation and being uh, so straightforward and frank and I must say courageous. I uh, so much respect and admiration for you and so many others who are uh, speaking out until today and will continue speaking out, I know and uh, uh, making us uh, all feel proud and, and uh, uh, hopeful that uh, so long as people like you are around, um, you know, the voice will, uh, will be heard at some point and we will do whatever we can. Uh, I don't know what we can do from the outside. A lot of people have illusions, but uh, I hope that uh, speaking with you uh, has provided some uh, additional knowledge and uh, information to others who are uh, watching and unfortunately we just lost Allah again uh, I, I did not thank him so either he comes back or I'll thank him here uh, to everyone here thank you all for joining uh, this is uh, podcast number two from uh, flow podcast which is a new podcast in which we talk to people that you really, really want to hear from, like Ala. Uh, last week, uh, we taught, we spoke with a uh, uh, Peman Jafali uh, on uh, the question of Iran. And uh, there we go. Here's uh, no. I thought I had it. All right. In all cases, there we go. Last week we spoke with. Uh, Peyman Jafali uh, on uh, the question of Iran and revolt. What is different about the revolts today in Iran? And uh, we will continue speaking with various uh, people that you might uh, be interested in speaking with. We'll also be addressing other issues other than politics, including culture. And there will be uh, enough uh, dose of uh, satire and, and the absurd because this is the world we live in. Let me uh, thank everybody who helped uh, produce uh, this uh, podcast and put it together and uh, bring to bear the information and knowledge that we shared. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Mary Kate Smith, and I would like to thank uh, Adil Skandar and others who contributed to this, and especially Leila Shaleen, who's uh, a remarkable 
uh, uh, mosaic that I shared with you was uh, uh, a great inspiration and a wonderful tool. Please check it out at rshif.org, r-s-h-i-e-f.org. And uh, hopefully you'll join us again next week.